Please welcome Wendy to the stage. I should really take Cleo off that now. It was a long time ago. Long time ago. Um, all right, the bird flu was not the ultimate crisis that everyone thought it would be because although the virus was very deadly, it wasn't particularly contagious. Now, if anyone following science, you'll know that earlier this year, it was published that some labs in the US and the Netherlands were able to tweak the virus so that it became contagious in ferrets anyway. Now, a little bit closer to home, there's some researchers at the University of Queensland that are making huge advancements in facial recognition technology. Now, according to the team, in a recent trial in an airport, around 4,000 passengers were successfully identified using CCTV cameras, facial recognition technology, and a database. Now, both of these technologies, these findings, are really remarkable just for the, the achievement, just for the sort of scientific curiosity. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see how both of these discoveries could be used for evil, could be dangerous. So, for example, if the weaponized bird flu got into the wrong hands, released into a population, could be devastating. If an irresponsible police department got a hold of a facial recognition technology system, they could use it to track a population, to track innocent protesters, and potentially dampen our freedom of speech. Now, we tend to blame regulators, police, politicians when the technology of scientists gets misused. But I'm arguing today that maybe we need to place a little bit more blame on the scientists themselves, the inventors of this technology. And this responsibility, this blame, doesn't come because they're scientists, but because they're part of society and they're creating things and pushing us in certain directions and they need to take responsibility for that. Just like we all do when we talk to people or punch people in the face. We need to take <laughs> responsibility for that. Um, now there's two general arguments, maybe more, but I'm only talking about two, um, why we don't like to put too much responsibility onto scientists for their creations. Now the first is kind of like a where do we draw the line, you know, at what point do we blame the scientists for their creations? There's very few eureka moments where one scientist comes up with the fundamental research and then produces this amazing application that we use in our lives. For the most part, science is a very long process. It can take hundreds, maybe thousands of scientists to come up from fundamental discovery to a creation. So where exactly do we start blaming the scientists and for what? You know, the obvious example, do you blame Einstein for the nuclear bomb? Now, taking this outside of the lab, we actually have the very same question, you know, at what point do you blame us, you know, people, or if you're scientists, when you're not in the lab, for certain things that you do? Let's go back to the punch in the face. Um, if I were to punch you, sir, um, unprovoked, in the face, um, and with my brute strength, you were to fall and you prick your finger on a spindle and sleep for a thousand years, Beauty and the Beast, or Beauty and Sleeping Beauty style. Um, you know, at what point do I really take the responsibility? Sure, you know, any facial problems due to the massive punch. Um, <laughs> But like this magical spindle toxin, am I really responsible for that? Now the, the general test that I guess uh, the legal sphere has come up with, and there's different formulations, but is your kind of reasonable foreseeability, you know, is it reasonably foreseeable that if I were to punch you in the face, you would fall spindle action? Um, probably not, so I'm probably not responsible for the whole sleep in a coma for a thousand years thing. Um, let's go back into the lab. We can use the same test really, you know, is it reasonably foreseeable that a weaponized bird flu, given all of the safety regulations that they have in these labs, could get into the wrong hands and released into the public? You know, let's go then again to the CCTV camera footage. 
is it reasonably foreseeable that a police department, irresponsible or maybe they think they're being responsible, begins using that facial recognition technology to track a population? My politics suggests that's probably more likely, but either way, these are the questions that we just need to start asking. And it's not necessarily an easy answer, and you're not necessarily going to get the same answer when you ask everyone. But these are the questions that I think we can start asking of our scientists. Because when you think about it, they're actually in the best position to answer them. They know how reasonable it is that their technology can be manipulated. They know how easy it is to then turn that weaponized bird flu, because at the moment, the weaponized version wasn't all that deadly, and it was in ferrets, so they know how easy it is in general, or they're best placed, to say how, how that could actually go if it was released into a human population and what it would take to make that dangerous. So therefore, I think it's important that we ask them that question. Now, a second really strong argument as to why we shouldn't start blaming scientists or putting any responsibility on them when their research gets misused is because it could halt technology. If scientists start thinking too much about what is reasonably likely of their technology, you know, any research could really get into the wrong hands and be misused eventually down the track. Maybe it would actually stop research, stop technology in its tracks. You know, for all we know, we, maybe we wouldn't have nuclear physics if, if Einstein just sort of stopped his work for fear that it would be malused. And I was thinking about this and I thought maybe, maybe, in some circumstances, that's okay, that we, we halt or we slow down certain research areas, certain discoveries, and it's the scientists themselves that think upon whether their research can be misused. And for the most part, they decide whether that needs to stop. And maybe that wouldn't actually slow technology down as much as we think it would, because these scientists won't just stop their work as scientists and become football players. They're scientists. They will use that intellectual uh, curiosity and they'll go into other research areas and perhaps then we'll be able to push society into new and exciting areas. So I was thinking, I guess, this all boils down to, although it's important to be moving in a society, you know, maybe in the words of our dear leader, Julia Gillard, we want to be moving forward. <laughs>